With that, uh, Daniel's going to come up. Uh, please turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the chair in front of you. Um, we're going to be on page uh, 926 in those black Bibles. And as you would, would you please stand as Daniel reads uh, the word for us this morning. All right, guys, we're going to be in page 926 in the Pew Bible. If you don't have one, a Bible of your own, feel free to take that one home. Uh, but we're in Acts 17. Let's see here. Verse 18. Verse 16. Acts 17, 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in every and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting for you bring some strange things to our ears we wish to know therefore what these things mean now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new so Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus said men of Athens I perceive that in every way you are very religious for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship I found also an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life, breath, and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from us, from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring." Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of, of, of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead." Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some joined them, some joined, some men joined him and believed, among whom were Dionysius, Dionysius uh, the Aeropagate, and a woman named Demarius, and others with him. The word of the Lord. We pray with me, Father, thank you for your word, Lord. The reason why we do that is because we believe what your word says. It's living and active, and it pierces our soul. And that's why we read it out loud. You even call us to, to read the words out loud. And, Lord, even that ministers to us. Lord, thank you, thank you for giving us your word that, that gives us your heart. And, Lord, today you, you've captured a story, a story that is very relevant even for us today, some 2,000 years ago. And in it, you've given us four steps um, Paul shows us four ways to reach our culture with the gospel, the gospel of the, uh, the resurrection. So, Lord, thank you as we, as we come and as prepare our hearts and minds to, to be open to what you would have teach us by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys should be seated. Well, in case you haven't noticed, um, the politi uh, elections are upon us, right? Does anyone, does anyone not know that there's like midterm elections coming up like Tuesday? Right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I've been reminded each and every day because nine out of ten times when the phone rings, who is it? 
It's people, you know, getting their message out. It's politicians having their, their little minions, so to speak, you know, getting their message out. You know, we're getting it from everyone. We're getting it from Democrats. We're getting it from Republicans. We're getting it from independents. I mean, I don't know. They got like the Santini's phone number on speed dials as well as yours. So I don't know how they do that. That's like a supernatural thing, right? And not only are they doing it from the phone, but every time you turn on the TV or the radio or on the internet, all these ads are popping up. Why? Because these guys are trying to get their message out. The politicians. They're doing their best to get their message out so people will vote for them. And, and, and by the way, side note, this is about as, a, as, about as you know, we're going to get as we're talking about the election. If you haven't vote, vote. It's one of the great privileges we have in the United States of America. Just get out and vote. All right, enough with that. All right, but now. So 2,000 years ago, Paul was not in a political race, um, but he was shaking hands and kissing babies uh, in his own way to get the greatest message out. The message of the gospel. And that's what we're going to look at today. And Paul gives us four steps to get out the greatest message of all time. As we said, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. These four steps worked 2,000 years ago and they still work for us today. So as we look at uh, Acts chapter 17, let's, let's be prayerful and mindful. And let's, as, we, as we walk through it, see where you might need to implement some of these steps. Number one, step one is a provoked spirit. Verse 16. Now, when Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. So here Paul is, as as we've been going through the book of Acts, line by line, verse by verse, Paul is waiting for Timothy and Silas in Athens. As you recall, at the end of chapter, uh, uh, at the end of the uh, 17, verse around uh, 19, uh, I'm sorry, around 14 and 15, Paul had to flee because of the persecution that was coming upon him. But, but Timothy and Silas stayed back, but, but Paul fled, and here he is in Athens, and he goes to the city Athens. Now, Athens is one of the most prominent and most celebrated cities in all of the ancient world, in particular back there. The capital city of Greece was this place called Athens. And in this golden age, it, 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 it great thinkers. It produced great thinkers, great writers, great artists. Um, you had Herodias, the father of history, that came from here. You had Socrates, the father of philosophy. And later on, you had Plato and Aristotle that came behind him. You had Hippocrates, who was the father of medicine. And you had all these great sculptures that would create these great temples and statues in the, in the Parthenon and all the temples. I mean, incredible artists and sculptures. So this was, was known for all of that. It was also known for its great warriors, its great armies. Uh, Greece in particular. Obviously that movie 300 came out a number of years ago. The Spartans, they were, they were part of this. Uh, great, they won great battles. I don't know if you knew this, but also Greece was considered um, the first to install a democratic society, a free society. Um, so when we think about Athens, think about the United States of America. When we think about Greece back then. Now, they were kind of the United States of America back then. Very prominent city. But when Paul comes, this is several hundred years after their their height, their peak of glory. But it's still a very, very significant city. It's still known throughout the world for all of its grandeur and glory. And he's walking through Athens right now as he's waiting for, for Silas and Timothy to come. And it says his spirit was provoked within him. Maybe that word provoked means uh, stirred up. He was agitated with what he saw in the city. It had nothing to do with its rich history in the arts. It had nothing to do with its rich history in medicine and philosophy or the beauty of the city. That's why, that wasn't why his heart was provoked. It was provoked, because scripture says, because of its idolatry. He, he saw through the beauty. He saw through the glory to the, is, the heart of the issue. It says, because he saw that the city was full of idols. Now, what is an idol? An idol is simply this, putting something in the place that is reserved for the true God alone. It's, it's, if God has created us to worship him, first and foremost, he is our, our greatest delight, our greatest glory, our greatest joy, and that's who we pursue of the highest treasure. And so when we put something else in his place and we pursue that, that was what we would call an idol. And here we see the city was full of idols. Another word would fool would be like, literally the city was under idols. If we were lived in the south, we would say it was swamped. The city was swamped with idols. Uh, the Romans would say, um, because it was under Roman captivity at this point, it said it would, e- it would be easier to find a god than a man in Athens. In other words, this, this city has so many statues, so many temples of all these gods and goddesses that it would be easier to find a god, a goddess, a temple, a statue than it would be a human being. That's what was the general consensus. 
And, and we know the usual suspects. We know our Greek mythology and our Greek gods, right? And if we were in Athens back then, we would bow to some of these gods. These would be some of the gods we would worship, right? Uh, we know like the, the big three, right? Who are the big three? We got Zeus, we got Poseidon, and we got Hades. Those are kind of the big three. And there's actually the big 12 um, that everyone knows. But that's the, that's the big three in which everyone knows. And then we have the second level. We have like Aphrodite's. She was the goddess of love and beauty and desire and fertility. So if you were married and you, and you were struggling having a kid, you would, you would go to her and you would, you would present offerings and, and sacrifices to her and say, man, this is what we've done for you, so would you please bless us? So you would do something to get something. So, so many of us would probably um, go after Aphrodite. If you're looking for love, if you're looking for a husband, you're looking for a wife, you would present offerings. Uh, uh, maybe some of us were in, uh, would go after Apollo when we go to his temple to worship because we love music and poetry. And that's what sparked us. And we wanted to be a great musician or we wanted to be a great poet. So we'd go to his temple or the Athena. Um, you know, if you want wisdom or, or, or knowledge, or she was the goddess of the crafts. So all you little scrapbookers out there, all you little Pinterest ladies, you know, you'd be like taking your scrapbooks and your Pinterest stuff and you'd be going to, the, you know, and laying it before Athena. Or maybe uh, some of you that are in like construction management, you build things. Uh, it'd be Hephaestus. I can't even say this guy's name. We'll just call him H. And we got actually pictures of some of these guys now. So let me give you a picture of H since I can't say his name. There he is, right? He's sitting on the anvil. You know, he's got tools around him. And so this is where you would go, you know, if you wanted to build something. You say, like, man, this is what I've done. Will you bless the work of my hands? He was the construction man. Uh, Plutus, we don't have a picture of him, but he was the god of money and security. Many people want to be rich and, and have their security, and that would go to him. We have, these, these the next two would be someone that I would go to, uh, the, the goddess of Nike. Her name is Nike, right? Like we get our shoes, right? Nike. She was the goddess of victory. So this is where the Olympians, the athletes, would go to her temple and offer up sacrifices and hope that she would bless them. And then you had uh, Artemis. There's another one. This is the, the goddess of hunting. The goddess of hunting. And then you had this real interesting one, Cloacina. Cloacina, let's put her up. Yeah, the goddess of the sewers, right? You know, you're... <laughs> I'm not making it. I mean, there's hundreds. They had goddesses for everything and gods and goddesses for everything. Now, now, why wouldn't heck would you need to worship the goddess of the sewer? You know? In fact, many of us sat on her throne this morning, right? Didn't we? <laughs> and, and there could be, I mean, there could be, we could go a lot of places with this, but we'll just stop right there, all right? But one pastor, as I was listening to him, he said he went and he said, you could really, I mean, go and, and they have temples of, you know, Cloacina. And, and one of the places he went, her nose was actually broken off, he said. And we can understand that, right? Goddess of the sewer. She, she probably broke off her own nose. But anyways, all right. But anyways, if we were back then, these are some of the temples. These are some of the statues. These are some of the gods and goddesses that we would go and make offerings to and hopefully that they would bless us. And, and Paul is walking around. He's seeing this everywhere. Everywhere he turns, this is what he's seeing. And his spirit is provoked. He can literally see and feel the darkness of idolatry. I was talking to Jennifer Brosa a number of weeks ago. She went on a, a little um, conference or something in, in uh, Utah. And she just came back and she said, you could just feel the darkness of that state in some of the places she went because of like the Mormon temples, etc. And I know what she's feeling because we played in Utah a number of times. And you, and you can feel it. It's, there's something different. And this is what Paul was seeing. This, this feeling, this darkness, this, this idolatry that he observes, it provokes his spirit. Now, how many of us, think about this, how many of us get provoked when we observe all the temples, all the idolatry going on here in the United States of America? I probably submit that most of us don't get provoked much because we don't think of these things as idols. We don't think of these things as temples that are surrounding us. And we do have some overt things. You know, we do have some overt temples in Ireland, like the, the Buddhist temples. You go to some cities, you can see the Buddhist temples. Um, uh, the mosques, you know, they're building mosques now, even here in Fort Collins. That, that would be considered a, a temple. Uh, the Mormon taper, uh, you know, we have Mormon temples all over here, little stakes. And I drive by one on Harmony all the time. And every time I drive by there, I mean, my heart is provoked with one with this a desire to just maybe just, instead of coming here on Sunday, just walking in that temple and just say, men of this temple, you know, and, and, and preach, but God hasn't put me there yet. But also sadness. It's just, man, I need to pray for them because they're caught in a, in a lie that's leading to a place that, that doesn't lead to blessing and joy, but leads to, to death and hell. So those are some overt temples that we see. 
But here in the United States, I bet you we have much more covert temples. Temples that, that have been created for us to enjoy. They're, they're, they're good. Some of them, are, there's nothing bad about these temples. And yet what we do is we put them in the place of God. Temples of worship. Tim Keller said, look at the biggest buildings in your city, and that could be a good indicator of what your city worships. So you think about the city of Fort Collins, and when you think about that, there's a, there's a number of things that come to mind. You know, we're, we're, we're a city of, of, of the intellect. We're, we're a highly educated community. We have a university here. We have a couple, uh, we have a college here. Those are, those are big buildings that we see. We, we have these hospital complexes. All these medical centers coming up. We look, we have Intel, and we have HP, and we have all these big, you know, computer industries, techie industries. Um, we have, you know, as we go downtown, we have more uh, micro brews per capita in here in Fort Collins than anywhere in Colorado. Um, here's another thing. We, we have more restaurant seating per capita than I think in any place in the country. So we like to go out and have fun. We like to eat and drink. We're a very athletic uh, and outdoors community. So this, see, these are some of the things that we might worship. And, and just back then, we have a couple more pictures. We have the, the Greek amphitheater. This is where the, the music will play. Let's play that. So, so man, look at that. That's like a 15, 20,000 seat amphitheater that they built back there to go see musicals and plays and concerts. And, and what would that be compared to today here? How about Red Rocks? Right? Looks pretty similar, doesn't it? And then we have these Greek athletic stadiums where they go to the Olympic Games to see these athletes compete. I mean, look at that. You got the state, you know, the stadiums up there, up there to the, uh, to the upper left. You got like the box seats, you know, that's where those things would be up there, right up there, the box seats. And then you have right here where the athletes come out and here is the arena right here. What does that look like? Oh. Yeah, right? We got the box seats up here. We got the stadiums here where the athletes come out and here's the arena. And notice I put the Invesco up there, not the Pittsburgh Steelers Heinz Field, because that's not idolatry when you're in the Pittsburgh. <laughs> All right. All right. Now, now, and then we have this last one. We have this last one. How about that one? Wall Street. Right? These are places that are covert. Now, what I'm not saying is if you go to a concert or if you, you go to Invesco to watch the Broncos play or if you, you work for a financial firm, you're an idolater. It's automatically you, you, you're, an, you're an idol worshiper. But what I am saying is there are millions of people who worship at these venues every single day. They give their lives to them. They give their time to them. They give their money to them. And time and money is a great indicator of your heart. Those are great fruit indicators of where your heart is. And see if you are battling with idolatry. Where do you spend the most time? Is it tough for you to get to a Sunday gathering? Is it tough for you to get to a life group? And yet when it comes to the Denver Broncos game, you're there every day, every Sunday ready to watch it, you got your gear on, you're ready to go, you never miss that, or you never miss one of the hobbies that you love to do, you're always there for that, never on time, I mean, never, yeah, never not on time, or where are you giving most of your money? I love Walter Martin, one old apologetics, he said he called it the doctrine of the checkbook. He said, look at your checkbook and see where all your money's going. Now again, it's not bad to again, spend your money on some of these hobbies, but the majority of your money is all going in here, and you can't find any place to, to give back to, to the Lord. You might have an idolatry problem. See, we, again, millions and millions of people battle us, and we can't dismiss our propensity as human beings. All of us, all of us, we need to be on guard. We can't dismiss our propensity as human beings to create and worship idols. John Calvin said this, the human heart is an idol factory, constantly producing idols. Every one of us from our mother's womb is an expert in inventing idols. Do you guys know what the opposite of Christianity is? A lot of people say the opposite of Christianity is atheism. But I think one said it even better than this. He said, atheism is not the opposite of Christianity. Idolatry is. Idolatry is. Atheism is not the opposite of Christianity. Idolatry is. That's a great statement. So step number one is as we observe the culture that we live in, where we live, where we work, and we play, do we have our eyes open? Are we observing how the enemy might be sneaking in and taking our eyes off of the one true God and replacing them with idols? And when we do that, is our spirit provoked? Are we agitated? Because when we do that, it leads to step number two. Step number two is that it will propel us to engage with everyone anywhere. Verse 17 through 21. And what we see here is we notice that Paul wasn't on a vacation. 
He didn't just lay back. Persecution, people are trying to kill him. He flees Berea, and he's just not like, man, I'm just going to lay low in Athens. He doesn't do that. He wasn't there for sightseeing or resting until Silas and Timothy got there. He was still on mission. He was engaged, and he wanted to engage people. We see that in verse 17. So he reasons in the synagogues with the Jews and the devout persons. We see the first place he goes, which is his habit, to the religious centers that he was had common ground with. He goes first to the, to the synagogues. And when he goes to the synagogues, he reasons with them. He opens up the Old Testament, and he talks to the Jewish men and the god feelers there about Abraham and Moses and Joshua and David and Solomon. And what does he do? He says, well, those are great men. Those are great stories. But they are all pointing to someone. They're pointing to Jesus. Jesus was the greatest, the greater Abraham. He was the greater father. Uh, Jesus was the, the greater Moses. He was the greater redeemer. Jesus was the greater Joshua. He was the better conqueror. Jesus was the better David and Solomon. He was the better king. And he would sit in the synagogues and reason with the men and women there to, to persuade them to come to Christ. These God feelers. And so who would that be in our context? Well, we could legitimately go, still go to the synagogues. They still exist. We have a couple here in uh, Fort Collins. One would be the congregation of Har Shalom. We could go there and reason, and we could open up the Old Testament Scriptures, and we have a common ground, and we could talk about these guys and show them how they point to Jesus. And we can also come to a church gathering. Just because you come to a building on a Sunday doesn't mean you're saved. There's God-fearers. Some of you guys are right on the edge, and what we do every... Again, is we proclaim the Gospel. We proclaim the Scriptures to you to show you who Jesus was, that He was truly man, but also truly God. And it's only by His life, death, and resurrection that someone comes to the Father and is saved. And we have some common ground, so we talk about this. And that's why, again, we preach the gospel every Sunday here. So he reasons with those in the synagogues. Then we see he goes on, not only from the synagogues, where there's some common ground. We'll talk about that a little bit even more. But then he goes out into the marketplace. It says, in the marketplace, every day with those who happen to be there, some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers, he also conversed with them. And now, these are the more, these are the more organic, informal meetings. The synagogue... Those are more the organized, formal means, the events that he goes, where he knows these things are going to be happening and taking place where he can reason. And then he goes out into everyday life, the marketplaces, where people are just living their lives. Uh, the marketplace, the agora, would be equivalent to like the city square, the city center of a city, where there would be like debates and there would be um, people um, doing business would take place. There'd be they'll be celebrating the you know the city's um, you know celebrations. Uh, the uh, there'd be all kinds of things happening. It'd be like downtown Fort Collins. That would be like the marketplace. That's where people go down to, to enjoy one another and, and get involved more into the city. And then there he would find these, these, these two kinds of groups of people, the Epicureans. They were the philosophers that would say, oh, the garden. They were basically hedonists. Their, their, whole, their whole philosophy was pursue pleasure. Pursue pleasure, the maximum amount of pleasure that you could get with the least amount of pain possible. Uh, they didn't worry about really worshiping God because the gods weren't interested in them. And so it sounds like some of the people we would uh, maybe encounter if we were down in downtown Fort Collins, that these people says, whatever sounds good to you, go for it, as long as it doesn't harm yourself or others. These, these would be guys that would say, live, eat, drink, and be merry. These are the, these kinds of guys. So these are the guys that Paul would engage with. Then you got these guys, the Stoics. The Stoics were these uh, the philosophers of the porch, they were known as. And basically, they believe that the world is controlled by some imper uh, impersonal force, you know, kind of like Star Wars, the force, right? Very similar to deism, but they were basically fatalists. And see if this rings true, if you know anyone that if you went down to Fort Collins or in your circle of influence, that the gods determined what was going to happen, and we just have to roll with the punches. It'd be something like this. It, people would say, it doesn't matter what I do. It's already been ordained. Whatever happens, happens. This is my lot in life, so this is what I get. Oh, well, just got to roll with the punches. I think we all know people that would be Epicureans, uh, Hedonists, and also Stoics even today. There would be more like face fatalism. So what we see here is Paul, provoked in his spirit, is engaging with people everywhere he went all the time. He was engaging the religious in the synagogues as well as the irreligious, the philosophers, in the downtown city center. As we are provoked by the idolatry around us, it should lead us to engage people everywhere all the time. Um, when we come here on Sunday gatherings, we, we, we come here not to just be consumers. We, we, we come here to, 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 yes, receive things from the Lord. 
Well, let's come in here hurt. We need to, we need to feel his, his blessing, His love, His graciousness. But we also come here to be active. We also come here to be active, looking to minister to others. Maybe, maybe there's people, not everyone here knows Jesus is saved. People need to hear it. People have questions. And we need to be a place where we ask people and engage people with the gospel to help them walk through and reason with them to hopefully find the answer in Christ. Life group's another one. That's why these things are so important that we go to. And then the marketplace. Where would the marketplace be in our lives? That would be like a, the gym, the restaurants, the parks, the movie theaters, the pubs, all those places. When we're, when we're out, when, when Rhea and I are going out on a date, uh, sure, some of it is just to enjoy each other. And, and, and maybe it'd be the time where I just need to decompress. Maybe Maria just needs to decompress and we just go out and we just want to be like, ah, we don't want to think about anything. We don't want to do anything. That would be a, a small percentage. The majority of the time that we go out, we should be having our ears and eyes open to our waitress, to our waiter. I, I should have my ears and eyes open to the guys in the gym that are lifting and we're having conversations with. Why? Because the purpose is that we're on mission to engage them with the gospel. That's what Paul was doing. So when we go out, we just, we just need to go out and, and walk in our circles of influence and just say, hey, this is just time for us. We just need to decompress or enjoy each other. Yes, we want to do that. They're good gifts that God gives us to enjoy. But remember, we want to be on mission. One thing we say around here always is we're just ordinary people living ordinary lives with gospel intentionalities empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul was doing. He was living his life like he does every day, just walking in the marketplace. And where people are living, he's living. And he's, ha he's looking for opportunities to share the gospel. He's intentional with his life. So he's engaged with people everywhere at any time. Maybe we need to implement this step into our lives. When we go to those places where we, you know, our circles of influence, where we have fun, or we, we just go to enjoy one another, it's like keep our eyes and ears open. Who would the Spirit might start a conversation with so that we could bring in the life-transforming gospel message to them? This is what happens when our spirits are provoked. They provoke us to engage people. Provoke us to engage people. Which leads us to the step three. In our engagement with people, we should look to find common ground. We should look to find common ground. We see that Paul does this in 22 and 23 verses. So here's Paul standing in the midst of them at the Areopagus. Now this would be a third place. This is like the intellectual center. This is where debatings happen. Um, this would be like almost like a college, a college campus. It's not the exact term, rough, but it's a rough equivalent. This is where the minds come to debate the, the ideas, the philosophy, the religions of the world. They would stand up, they'd get their opportunities, they would speak, and there would be counter-arguments, and they'd be going after. So Paul even goes to this third place. And notice what he does is the first thing he does, he tries to find common ground with them. He gives them a compliment. He says this, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I pass along and observe the objects you worship. This is a great principle. He's saying, hey, look, guys. As I'm walking, I see, I see these temples, and I see these, these statues. I see everything you work." Man, you, you guys take your faith seriously. And that's a good thing. He says, you guys are serious about what you worship. He, you guys are serious about figuring out that there's something greater than yourself out there. He says, you're, you're very religious. We would say you're very spiritual these days. It, it, he starts out with a compliment. Now, some people think he might be being a little sarcastic here, but I think in the context, he's... He's trying to find common ground with them so he can connect them to the gospel. Paul's acknowledging. He's saying, hey, man, you guys, again, are serious about what your religion says. Now, again, as I said, we're opened up. We're in the elections, right? And there's some um, intense debate going on with people out there, isn't there? Not only on TVs, not only in the you know, marketplaces or at these intellectual centers. And, and people are going to have different beliefs with you. And when I, when I go and have con in contact with, say, an environmentalist or an animal rights activist, um, I try and find common ground with them so I can kind of make my point. Now, I don't always do this perfectly. Let me case in point. Um, it was right before our hunting trip, 
And uh, I went down to Boulder because I needed to buy a tent. They didn't have a tent here in Fort Collins, so they had the tent was down in Boulder. So I go down in Boulder to buy this this one man tent. And um, as I'm checking out, there's this you know young college gal, and and she's like bubbly, she's chatty and relevant, you know. She's like, oh hey man, man, this is a great tent, you know. I use this tent when we go hiking here, there. Where where, where are you going camping? Where are you going hiking? I said, uh, I'm not. I'm gonna go kill an elk with my bow, is what I said. <laughs> and she. Her bubbliness just kind of dissipated and went away. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Have a very good day. You know, and it's just like, yeah. And that was, that was just me not being, not trying to find common ground. That was just me being, yeah, an idiot, so to speak. <laughs> wanting, wanting to, you know, spark, yeah. All right. But usually, we, we want to try and, and find common ground. You know, I, I don't want to call an environmentalist or animal right, you know, a tree hugger. Uh, oh, you're an environmentalist. Oh, you're a tree hugger. You know, um, I, don't, I don't want to call someone. You know, oh, you must be anti-American because you don't, then don't want to build the Keystone Pipeline. That's not how we start conversations with people that that differ from us, um, and that's not what Paul did. He he starts out with, a, hey, let's 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 get into this. Oh, man, that's a good thing that you're religious. I, I see you take that very seriously. Well. Well, so do I. We want to create an atmosphere that's not tense. We want, to, we want to have a winsome personality so that people would be open to hear what we would have to say. This is what Paul is doing here. And this is a good principle for us. When we're engaging people, it's like, man, if they have a different view than us, let's, let's try and find some common ground so they would be open to what we have to say. And especially when it comes to engaging in spiritual dialogue, because there's a lot of people that have some very just warped beliefs on what Christianity is because they've had some very bad examples. And we need to acknowledge that. We need to acknowledge when, you, when, when I say I'm a Christian, there are going to be some people that are going to react to that because they've had people that said they were Christian do some very bad things to them. And if I don't engage them and find that common ground on what happens and why they believe that way, I'm, going to, I'm not going to have a chance. Now again, the Spirit of God convicts the heart. Our, our God is to be ambassadors, but one way we're ambassadors is when we find that common ground. Well, well, why do you feel that way about Christians? Tell me, what, what has been your experience? And then when they say this, I can be like, oh my goodness. I, I, and I might need to say, man, I need to ask for forgiveness because of what they did was, was not a good representation of who Christ is and what His grace and love and mercy are. We might need to meet people there first. And if we don't start and try and find common ground with them there, we might not ever get there, and we might miss them right off the bat. And there's a couple comforting scriptures when we, when we engage people spiritually like Paul is doing. There's some assumptions that we can make about every person that's ever lived. And it's this. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says it like this. It says, God has put eternity into the hearts of men and women. And what we can be assured of when we're entering spiritual dialogue, no matter what their experience has been, is that everyone understands that there is a God. That's what Ecclesiastes says. That God, when He creates us, human beings, He's put in all of us this, this idea that there is something bigger than themselves. Now, we also know that Romans 1 says that God has made it known to everyone. Again, He's put eternity in all their hearts. But some people suppress the truth. And that idea of suppressing the truth is, I don't know if you, it, uh, the greatest illustration I've ever heard is like when, you, when you're going swimming and you're in a pool and you have like a, a basketball or a beach ball that's filled up with air, and you try and keep that ball underwater, what happens? It wants to pop up, right? So the truth wants to pop up, but people literally suppress the truth of God. They, they keep pushing it down and down and down. And it says this, they exchange the glory of God for images or mortal men or animals. Sounds a lot like Athens. Verse 29 says, being then God's offsprings, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art or imagination of man. These people are suppressing the truth. And so the, 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 the company um, principle that we know is that every person that we dialogue knows that there's a God out there. Now some of them are suppressing it because... Of, of sin. Some, uh, I was suppressing it. You were suppressing it before Christ. It's like, no, that's not true. I'm going to go live after this idol. But some of us, so when we engage in dialogue, we got to find that common ground so that people, again, would be open to, to sharing where they're at so that we could be like a doctor and apply the right remedy. 
Again, we've talked about this a lot. When, I, when we go to a doctor's office, the doctor asks a series of questions to kind of figure out what's wrong with you. And once he figures out what's wrong with you, he presents the remedy. And this is what Paul does. And he even finds more common ground in verse 23. He says, I find also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, where therefore you worship as unknown, this I pray, I proclaim to you. He says, the strange new teaching that I'm bringing to you about this unknown God that you have this altar to, I'm going to make him known to you. His name is Jesus, and he rose from the dead. And here's the great thing is they can't say no to him. Why? Because they have an altar to an unknown God. They can't say no because they might think, this just might be the name of the unknown God that we need to ascribe to this guy because they were open to anything. And so they had receptive ears because, again, Paul came in and found common ground with them. And then it leads to step four. Step four is that Paul contextualized the gospel, verse 24 through 31. And what we see here is we see him start with God as creator. Uh, as we've been going through the book of Acts, we see when he goes to the synagogues, we've talked about this contextualization a couple weeks ago in much, much more detail. But when he goes to the synagogues, he begins with the Old Testament scriptures, and he begins talking about Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all these guys. Why? Because they can relate to him. They know what he's saying. They're familiar with those stories. They're familiar with the Old Testament. But here, when he's dealing with Gentiles and the Areopagus, he doesn't go there. Why? Because they're not familiar with Moses. Remember, it's a strange new teaching. These things are new to these people that they're hearing. So what does he have to do? He has to take the message and put it in a language in which they would understand. That's what we call contextualization. Contextualization is putting the gospel and the message of the gospel in terms that people can understand and relate to. So therefore, dealing with Gentiles, these Greeks, um, they were very big into creation. They, they, they were very big in the gods, and so that's where he began. And what we see here is we see Paul walk them through the gospel. He begins with God as creator, and then he goes, God as judge. Then he says, God is resurrected, and there's a response that is needed from you. And what Paul is doing here is he's literally defragging you guys are familiar with that computer term, right? We all have computers, right? When our computers get slow or something, we hit this button called defrag. And what does it do? It takes away all the junk that's slowing down our computers that it doesn't need. It's getting the right data, put it in the right spot so our, our, things, our computers will run smoothly. And that's what Paul is doing. He's defragging their worship system. He's saying, you start out right, you, you're right. There, there is a God. But you have all this other stuff, all this bad data. What we need to do is get rid of all this, these gods and put the, the right uh, um, language and the right, and to tell you who this God is, to give you the right, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Get, get you in the right worship system to point you to the one true God. We gotta get that data all in place so that you will understand who you're worshiping, the one true God. It's not many gods, it's one God. And what he does in these, these verses, he gives at least six contrasts of, of their bad data, and he replaces it with six good data points. Number one, there is one God, and he is the creator. It's not many gods who create, verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth. So that's number one. There's not all these different gods. There's one God. There's one God that you need to worship. Number two, God does not dwell in temples made by you. He does not need for us to feed him or clean the dirt off him. God is self-sufficient. God is self-sufficient. Verse 24 says, He does not leave, live in temples made by man. Verse 25, Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. We, I want to remind you of Habakkuk. When we talk through Habakkuk, just, just see how, really how foolish this is. And, and, and they did it back then, and we do it all the time. Is they, they create all these idols with their own hands. And this is what Habakkuk said. It says, What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes a speechless idol. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake to a silent stone, Arise! Can this idol teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, but there's no breath in it. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, guys, look, look at the, all these temples and all these statues. You've made these things. And it's like you go into your garage. you got this big old marble slab. The, 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 he's chiseling stuff, and he makes this incredible statue. 
But he says, well, before we take out, we got, we got, we got to clean up all the, all the excess. And then once they clean up all the excess, then they just go down and bow down to it and be, oh, great God of so-and-so, give me this. How foolish is that? What Paul is saying is God is self-sufficient. He's alive. He's real. He doesn't live in temple. In fact, the New Testament even says that when he rises, we are the new temples. Everyone who believes in Christ is the temple of God. We can't make him up. Number three, God is sovereign. He creates and rules people and the nations. He's not passive. Verse 25b, since he himself gives to all mankind life, breath, and everything, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. He's contrasting that the one true God is in control of everything. He's very much involved. Number four, God is knowable and cares. He is not unknowable and distant like many of them thought that these gods were. Verse 27, 28, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. And then what he does is he quotes two of their poets. Two of their poets. He doesn't quote scripture. He doesn't quote the Old Testament. He quotes their poets. The first one, in him we live and move and have our being. He's quoting Epimenides, as some of your own poets have said. And then the second one, he's, he's quoting Erasmus. It says, for we are indeed his offspring. He's saying, look at your own poets. Your own poets acknowledge this God, who he is. This God is knowable, and he does care that you should seek him, and when you seek him, you might find him. And then number five, that God is a righteous judge. He's not capricious like all these other Greek gods. You never knew it when you stood with these Greek gods. And Paul is saying, hey, he's a righteous judge. You know exactly where you stand with him because he's made it known. In fact, he said the time of ignorance of God has overlooked it. In other words, he's, he's given you all these years where you have the statue of your unknown God. Well, I'm bringing to you, I'm revealing to you the one true God today. And this is what he says. So you guys are not, hmm, I wonder if this is what he means. This, this is what he calls us to. He says, but now he commands everyone to repent because he has fixed a day on which, which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Now, the one thing we're doing is these, these are just bullet points. The, the, the message that Paul gave was probably hours long. And so he could explain some of these things. He could explain that, that man has rebelled against God. And the only way to get back into God's presence is to repent, to acknowledge that they've sinned, that he's fallen, that we've rebelled and that we need to repent of our sins and trust in this judge who will rule. And when he rules, he will rule by righteousness. And who is this man that he appointed? He goes on to say the one that he's resurrected. It's, it's Jesus Christ. He is the one way. He is the God. He is the substitute for us. And this thing about God is a righteous judgment. Again, he's not capricious. And, you know, this judgment will come. I, I often hear... People say, and I think there's some there's some truth to it. They say that um, hell is not the eternal separation from God, or they say that what hell is literally is that we're eternally separated from God. Okay, could be true, but I heard one say it this way, and I think this is this is what hell is. Hell is is facing the righteous judgment of God on your own. That that's what hell is. It's when we try to say to God, look what I've done at the judgment seat of God. Look what I've done. Look at my merits. Look at all my good deeds. When the judgment comes, that's hell. But that's where Jesus comes in. He just doesn't leave us there. He says, hey, but that doesn't have to be you. That's why Jesus Christ came. That's why he came and lived the perfect life in your place and my place, a life that we could not live perfectly. We couldn't do enough good works. We couldn't pay for it. He had to come and live the perfect life for us. He had to then die on the cross to make payment for our sin. The judgment that some, many people will get at the great white throne judgment. He took that on for us. And then he rose again. The resurrection proves that everything he said before proves that it's right. It's true that we can, we can believe it and put our lives on it because Jesus said before, he says, destroy this temple in three days, I'm going to raise it up. And then when he does that, 
we can say, I'm going to follow that guy because he does exactly what he says. And so when, the, when we go to the white throne judgment, which everyone will go through that's ever existed, when we stand before God, we're not going to get hell because we're not based on our own merits. We're going to get heaven because Jesus will be the one standing in our place. And when God looks at us, he sees Jesus and he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what grace is. Our, our, our works righteousness goes to Jesus on the cross. He pays the penalty. He gives us his righteousness. So when it comes to that throne judgment, that we don't get hell, but we get heaven. This is what Paul is communicating. And it, it, can you imagine the scene there? For These people are hearing this for their first time. This truth, God is a righteous judge. He's not capricious. He will judge, but he's also given us the way out. He's given us the remedy. God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to be our substitute. So what we need to do is repent and believe in him. And that's number six. Jesus is the only way to God. He is Lord and Savior. And this is where he gets to the resurrection. There are not many roads. He is the road. Verse 31. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Again, verse 18. Uh, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, literally foreign gods, because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. A great, a great text to say, well, people say, well, Jesus was just a great man. Well, when he's debating here, they recognize what he was saying about Jesus, that Jesus was God. And they wanted to hear more. And so we see that Paul contextualized the gospel with these Greeks that had no concept of who he was. They began and spoke in common language. He began with creation. And then he went to judgment. And then he went to the resurrection. And they talked about repenting, and there needs to be a response. And what we see is we do see three responses. Luke records three responses for us. He says this, some people, verse 1, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. You go back to verse 18, it says, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? And that was just a, a major insult calling Paul a babbler. It, 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 they were calling Paul a seed picker. And what that means is this word babbler back then, it would, be, it would be used for birds that would just go along the ground and pick up seed. And they fly to the next place, go to the ground, pick up seed. And so what they were saying is like, you're, you're a second-rate thinker. You're, you're a puppet, Paul. All you do is you go from spot to spot, you pick up a little bit of here, a little bit here, and you put it all together to make up this, this religion. You're a second-rate thinker if you're, if you're that. And, and we're going to get that when we're out living life. When we say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus, people are like, huh, you're an idiot, you know? We've all re experienced that. Oh, you're narrow-minded. Oh, you're a bigot, you know? We're, people are going to mock us. That, that's going to be part of it. They mock Jesus, they're going to mock us, they mock Paul. So that's going to be one of the responses. But that doesn't dissuade Paul. He still goes on. Because there's other, two other categories of people. The second response is this, but others say, we will hear you again about this. They're curious. They heard this message for the first time. They're like, wow, I've never heard that before. And they're like, I want to hear you again. Verse 18, others said he seemed to be a preacher of foreign divinity, uh, divinities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, man, we want to know this new teaching that is being presented. For you bring some strange things to our ears, and we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Guys, there, there's people out there that we're going to come in contact with that have never heard of the gospel. They're just not. We're not a Christian nation. It, it, it might have been our contacts in 1776, but it's definitely not our contacts now. 70% of the people in Europe, this is a quote by Steve Timmons and them, so they have no desire to go to church. They never step foot in the church. They, they don't know. They can care less about the Bible. America is right behind them. We're probably not 70% of the people don't know anything about this, but there's a good percentage of people that don't. And so this is where we need to come and engage them. And when they hear for the first time, it's going to pique their interest because they're going to see the reality. All of a sudden, that thing that God has created in all of us, that there is a God and He's put eternity in everyone's heart, they're going to start connecting the dots by the power of the Spirit. And they're like, man, I want to, I want to hear you again. I want to dialogue. That was many of you in here. 
when you started to hear those things, you had no concept. My wife never went to church. She, she, the first time my wife heard the gospel is when she came home to Thanksgiving at our house when we were soft, uh, freshmen in college or sophomore in college. There's, there's a lot of people that are like her. And when, when she heard it, it piqued her interest. So that's the, when we share it, and then finally number three, the third response is, they're going to repent and believe. The Spirit's going to work on their heart, take out the heart of stone, give them the heart of flesh, and they're going to repent and believe. And that's many of you in this room. This is me. Again, when we hear the gospel, it sounds so good. We, we, we recognize that we can't do it on our own, and we need a Savior. We recognize the bad news first. And we see that there's a remedy, and we grab on to that remedy. We rep repent, and we believe in that remedy, because it's the remedy that gives us salvation. So what steps do you need to implement this week? One, do we need to be better observants in the, in the culture that we live in? Do we got to have our eyes and ears open? Is that where we need to start? And then when it does that, the, the, the Spirit is provoked in us? Or do we need to engage people? Maybe we, we see the landscape clearly. We can identify our cultural you know, boundaries and understandings and what drives the city of Fort Collins and the place around us, but we don't engage. We, we, we drive home, we open up the garage, we, we drive into our carports, not carport, we go drive into our garage, we shut the garage, it closes, and then we leave everything in the back of our porch, never come in contact with anyone we engage with. We go to a restaurant on a date night, and we'll all we expect is serve, serve, serve. Well, remember, we've talked about this. When we go out to eat, it's our job to serve the wait staff, or the waiters, or whoever we come in contact with, because we're on mission. Or when we engage people, do we do we gotta do we gotta be we gotta incorporate a winsome personality? Do we have to find common ground? Give people compliments, say, man, I, man, that's great you care about the environment. That's great you want to say the owls in Oregon. You know, man, that's, that's a noble thing. Wh wh where'd you get that? Who, who put that in you? So that we can engage them there. Or five, do we just need to open our mouths and present the gospel in a way in which they can understand it? This is what Paul did in Acts chapter 17. Very, very relevant and real and productive 2,000 years ago as for us today. So let's implement these four steps. And, and, and when we do that, it, it begins with a humility in our own heart, knowing that those that we're going to come in contact were just like us. We were once separated from the Lord. And it's not that we're, any, we're smarter or that we're better. And that's why the, the Lord saved us. No, we are just as far off. We are just as rebellious. And yet by the power of the Spirit, He took our heart and again, gave us a heart of flesh that opened our eyes and that we trusted and believed when we heard the gospel. For some of us, it was the first time we heard it. It was like, oh, man, that's so good news. I want to get it now. For others, it took time. It took time. But that's our desire. That's our desire, is that we are missionaries out to the world in our spirit, uh, circles of influence. Ordinary people living ordinary lives with gospel intentionalities empowered by the Spirit. Let's pray.